Marion, I know you've been involved in many exciting and important projects, and today I would like to find out a little bit more about them. Uh, Marion, Breland, Bailey, why don't you start out by telling a little bit about your background? Okay, I went to high school, grew up in Minneapolis, Minnesota, was born and grew up in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and uh, graduated from Washburn High School there uh, back in 1938. And then I went to the University of Minnesota, which of course was right inside the city of Minneapolis. And I got my uh, bachelor's degree, BA, uh, in uh, 1941 at uh, the University of Minnesota. And uh, right after I graduated, uh, I got married to Keller Breland. He was a, a graduate student there at the time, and we were in summer classes together, even though I was a senior. And uh, we got married, uh, and uh, both went on into graduate school together. Uh, we were the first couple at the University of Minnesota to get married, and the department rather frowned on it. They weren't used to married female students, I guess. So, uh, But anyway, they didn't kick me out. <laughs> so uh, we went on and went to school there together. And uh, I had started out in high school with a strong interest in foreign languages. I really planned to major in foreign languages. And actually, at the University of Minnesota, I finally wound up getting a joint major and a joint minor. I had a major in psychology and a major in Latin and a minor in Greek and a minor in child psychology. So it was kind of a strange combination. What a combination. Yes. <laughs> what uh, got you started to start your interest in psychology there? I mean, what well, was Dr. Skinner? It was B.F. Skinner. So he was the other new person in the program. Yes, right. He was, uh, it was his first teaching job after he uh, got his degree at Harvard. And uh, he had a small class of uh, st students that he personally selected to go into his uh, particular personal teaching of psychology. And uh, most of the other students were in classes of 200, 100 uh, to 200 to three, even 300 in general psychology. So I considered I was very fortunate to be in this small class. I didn't realize at the time how fortunate I was. Because <laughs> Skinner, of course, was very new. He wasn't famous at all, and, uh, but he was a very good teacher. It was a very stimulating class. Now, given that you were so interested in foreign languages, <clears throat> You were interested in those during high school. Yes. What? Where did you first begin really interested in psychology? Was it just? It just. It was simply the fact that I got into Fred Skinner's general psych class. I didn't even know too much about psychology at the time. I was going to take it for uh, my, I believe, for my science requirement at the university. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I say, it was. Uh, well, actually, it was at the urging of my Latin professor, my major advisor. Uh, he knew Dr. Skinner, and he was from Harvard also, the Latin professor. And uh, so he, I believe he was the one that recommended me to uh, Skinner as a student for his class. And so that's how I got into it, and with the results that, <laughs> that came about. What other hobbies and avocations did you have? back through the high school and early college? Oh, swimming, bicycling, outdoors mostly. Uh, well, I did a lot of reading, uh, and I did some writing. I used to write novels, uh, mystery novels and poetry and all sorts of things like that. And, uh, I did some playing around with art. I never took art lessons formally, but I used to, I, do a lot, I did a lot of sketching and oil painting and sort of just hobby sort of thing, as I say, never got very good at it. Now, given Skinner's interest in writing, did he know of your interest? Yes, I think he did. I don't, I don't recall particularly it being, you know, discussed very much or a strong point, but uh, he realized I was interested in literary things. And I believe that's why he sicked me on some projects with regard to literature when I uh, started going on in psychology. and. Uh, he uh, actually, when I went into graduate school, he tried to get me to do a um, 
an analysis, uh, behavioral analysis of uh, Thoreau's uh, Walden. And uh, that kind of fell flat on his face because I didn't quite know how to go about it. And I don't think he did at the time either. He was getting into his verbal behavior uh, thing. He, he was not able to give me any it was sufficiently clear ideas of well, the type of analysis he was looking for in this. And uh, I never finished the research because it was not pan the things I decided to do on my own were not panning out. And uh, But I also, um, uh, he asked me to help him uh, uh, transcribe his verbal behavior lectures. He gave a class in verbal behavior. And uh, we, he recorded it on, goodness, an old dictaphone, as I recall, a horrible mm. instrument. And I uh, transcribed these lectures, and that formed the basis for his verbal behavior book. And that was a fascinating project. Uh, and of course, very interesting to me personally, because mm -hmm. I was interested in that kind of thing. And that, and that was combining your fields. Yes, right. Mm -hmm. okay. was it, when at that time was it that you became more and more focused on operant? I'd say it was along about in my uh, second year, about in my junior or senior year as, a, in, as an undergraduate, because we were learning, all of the students there who uh, had been in Skinner's class and also uh, attended some of his informal, informal seminars that he held, usually at his home, uh, were very much getting indoctrinated into operant conditioning. We all read the behavior of organisms that had just come out in 1938. Skinner tried to discourage me from reading it to start with. He said it's a terribly difficult book. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody found it difficult reading. It's mm -hmm. packed with material, of course, and so different that it was hard to read. But mm -hmm. uh, we persisted, and so I read it in spite of what Skinner suggested. <laughs> <laughs> no. That was before he wrote many of his, you might say, more popularly written books, mm -hmm. like The Sci Science and Human Behavior and uh, some of the others. Now, did you see him using some of the operant methods on his own writing that he later related in terms of measuring and graphing? And I'm not sure that he was doing that. I don't recall his deliberately applying this to his own verbal behavior at the time. He may have been and was not explicit about it, but I didn't, it wasn't obvious at any rate. Uh, what experiences did you have with his family at that time? Oh, uh, well, I was fortunate uh, there, too. Uh, the, as I say, we, the students, uh, many of the students were invited to his home for these seminars, and I got to know the family. And he had a small daughter, a uh, very small daughter, about, I can't remember how old she was when I first knew them. I think she was about eight months old. That's Julie Skinner Vargas. Uh, and um, then the summer, when I transcribed his lectures from the dictaphone, I had a combination job where I was transcribing and babysitting for them. <laughs> so I was over there several days a week and uh, taking care of the baby and uh, doing the, uh, the dictaphone transcription. So I really think I did a better job taking care of the baby than I did with the dictaphone. I'm a terrible typist, so I was <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it seemed to go all right both ways. But yeah, a delightful family. He just had the one little girl at the time, and uh, his wife Eve. Uh, or she was she, her name was Yvonne at the time. As later she changed her name to Eve. Uh, she was a very interesting person. She had had uh, pretty much a, a literature background, and I believe she had been an English major, and she was an interesting person to talk to. Yeah. What do you uh, remember that you can tell us about his Skinner as a father of a young child, in terms of his reactions oh, to Oh, he was a very good father, a very devoted father, very attentive, and um, he certainly was applying his own principles on raising his his children. I, I actually, well, his child at that time was the only one I knew personally because he had gone to Indiana by the time the second mm -hmm. baby Deborah was born. But um, uh, he was very consciously rewarding, reinforcing good behavior and extinguishing those things which were not and uh, uh, did a lot of uh, 
when she began to talk, uh, a lot of reinforcing of verbal responses and so on. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was with uh, one of his, um, I can't remember, I believe it was Eve's sister who had a child, a little baby, who cried all the time at night. And they did some extinction work on the crying and reinforcing the child when uh, it was silent and so forth. Well, while I was there, they, the child was visiting in their home at the time. Uh, my impression of the technique was that it wasn't working terribly well at the time, but I, <laughs> I don't really know how it came out. Uh, as I recall, the parents of the baby were somewhat distressed, but I believe it finally did uh, uh, turn out all right. Uh, if the parents were sufficiently persistent, and I guess the technique has worked with other <laughs> infants, so. Uh, but I do remember that particular incident. Now there was one other class, one class, especially, that you and Keller were in together, where there were a number of other well-known psychologists who were there as students. Right, and many of those were Skinner's students. I don't recall the name of the class. Now, it was not, as I recall. At first, I thought it was his general psychology class, but it was a class he taught in, uh, at the senior level, I think, a junior or senior level. And I don't recall which class it was. Who were some of those people? Um, Bill Estes, William K. Estes, uh, Norman Gutman, Paul Meal, um, Howard Hunt. Let's see. It's like, wow. Yes. <laughs> uh, and there were a couple of others whose names escape me right now. But many of them, of course, came, went on to become eminent in, in psychology. The only one of those who didn't have a strong behavioral bent, uh, I would say, would be Paul Meal, although he certainly made some contributions to behavioral uh, theory and, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, so on. Um, Howard Hunt at first uh, made a great deal of fun of <laughs> behavioral methods and he was a clinician. He wanted to go into clinical work and, and uh, there was a sort of a battle going on between the uh, behaviorists and the clinicians at Minnesota at the time. So we teased each other a lot and wrote songs about each other and things of that sort. But Howard uh, finally went on to become quite a behavior therapist. That was the, certainly the orientation he used in his clinical work. He remained a clinician, but very much a behavioral clinician. So. Now, when in there did you first get your hands-on experience with animals? Uh, in my undergraduate days, I started working uh, with, uh, I did some rat experiments. Uh, actually, the first ones I did were not, you might say, behavior modification type experiments. They used uh, Skinner boxes and cumulative records, but they were more uh, investigating some problems that uh, uh, Dr. Bill Heron, William Heron, had been working on for years. Uh, uh, you remember the maize bright and maize dull rat mm -hmm. strains? Mm -hmm. Well, they, they had colonies of those strains at Minnesota, and they were testing various uh, studying various uh, aspects of their behavior with the use of this array of Skinner boxes, which was in the lab, and the cumulative recorders. And my very first research project, my very first published paper was on food satiation curves in maize bright and maize dull rats, mm. uh, resulting that the, in the findings that the maize bright rats ate a lot more than the maize dull ones which is an interesting, I, mm -hmm. I, thought, I thought it was interesting at the time. So that was my first published paper as an, uh, as an undergraduate. <laughs> now your first operant work with animals. Uh, the first operant work with animals uh, came uh, in graduate school. And again, it had to do with um, uh, projects that uh, Skinner was working on. Plus the fact we began to see, uh, my husband and I, Keller Breland, uh, and I saw some of the fascinating possibilities here, and we got an, had a number of pets, and and we tried them out various things. A dog we had that was um, <laughs> kind of a disaster in a way. Well, the poor dog got distemper, and it had uh, all sorts of troubles associated with the distemper. So I think it was not a fair to, for <laughs> fair trial. Uh, but we had a number of um, smaller animals we worked with. 
And uh, we did, I, I don't even recall now the nature of what we were doing with Skinner in the lab, but uh, that was as uh, graduate students. The big experience came when we left with Skinner to work on the Pigeon Project. And that's where we really got into applying operant conditioning principles with a serious purpose and uh, a very, um, very good results. Okay, we left with Skinner to where? Yes, the two, well, it was all done in Minneapolis. We left the university. Mm -hmm. Uh, when the war was on by then, of course, as, as I mentioned, I got my undergraduate degree in 41, and uh, we were, uh, it, of course, it was just seven months after that, or no, let's see, well, approximately, yeah, five, I don't recall, but anyway, it was during that year, of course, that war was declared, and um, Skinner very much wanted to do something to help the war effort, and uh, he seized on the idea of using animals in some form to assist the military. And he tried various things. That's where we actually got some of our early operant experience was working on some of the animals that he had, too. He had a dog that he named Pavlov because it drooled so much. And, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he was aware, apparently, that there had been some work done. Uh, not much was known about it at the time, but the Russians had been using uh, dogs to blow up tanks, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, had you, and of course, homing pigeons had been used during the First World War. And so Skinner was just sort of feeling his way around, seeing what an animal could do that would fit in. And uh, then he got the idea of birds guiding missiles. And he started out with um, some crows. He had heard the, you know, the folk stories, uh, the tales of how smart crows were and how good their vision was. They had a uh, popular representa uh, reputation of having very good vision. So he obtained two young crows. Now he had been up, we went up to a farm in uh, northern Minnesota, I was up near Brainerd, um, and looked at a pet crow up there. And this pet crow was a delightful animals. He was do all sorts of things. They, they had trained him in some little tricks and he was very much a pet of the family. Well, the mistake Skinner made was getting two crows at once because at that time the facts of imprinting were not known. And the fact that these crows living, growing up together became imprinted to each other and none of us realized what the results of that were going to be. The crows remained wild, intractable, absolutely impossible to work with. So he abandoned crows. Mm -hmm. And uh, if we'd known then <laughs> what we know now, it mm -hmm. might have been a different story. But uh, then he realized how pigeons had been so very adaptable to all sorts of military conditions and to domestic life. So he got the notion of using pigeons. And that's where the Pigeon and a Pelican got started, the uh, Pigeon Missile Project. And uh, we went to uh, General Mills, agreed to take a, on this project. The Navy, you know, all of the military units at that time worked with civilian contractors in quite a different arrangement than they do now. So it was a Navy contract, but it was under the auspices of General Mills, and I don't remember or never knew a lot of the details of the administrative mechanisms and so on. But we moved into the loft of the Washburn Crosby Mill in Minneapolis uh, where they made the gold medal flower and set up the banks of trainers for the pigeons. They were mock-up mock, mock -up missiles and the pigeons were trained to home in on targets that represented targets of potential military interest, um, airfields, railroad mm -hmm. centers, and things of that no nature. And they were, the targets were projected against this uh, ground glass screen in the nose cone of this missile. And there was a lot of, there were many mechanical problems of getting the uh, nose cone to keep centered and so on. I, I never got into that. None of us, uh, the behavioral assistants, none of us got into that sort of thing. But. Uh, there were several of us who went with Skinner at the time, myself, my husband, 
Bill Estes and his wife Kay, Norman Gutman, and I believe one other student later came aboard with that project. But uh, we all worked as research assistants with Skinner on that project for many months. And uh, it was at that time, uh, Skinner was having trouble <clears throat> with just one of the birds, as I recall at the time, uh, actually pecking the target. Most of them went to it fairly readily. And this is where we saw the first demonstration of shaping. And where uh, Skinner used a series of approximations to get this bird to the target and start pecking on it vigorously and so forth. We also had our first uh, experience with ratios, uh, figuring out what ratio was best for these pigeons and build the problems of building up ratios without getting extinction and, and so on. So Was he we, using the word shaping at that time? He tended to use differentiation as the term. And I don't recall, I believe somewhere in there he started using the word shaping. I honestly don't recall, mm -hmm. but it was a dramatic demonstration. And that's where Keller and I got the notion that as soon as we could after the war, we were going to get into some kind of an application of this. It was so good. Mm -hmm. And we started writing little papers, mostly to ourselves and to you know, some of the other graduate students about how good this system was, how it really worked. And we became convinced that the theory worked a lot better than most psychologists at the time dreamed of. And that was true, of course, but we didn't know that at the time. Uh, but we were very much impressed. And, uh, now, your salary was being paid for by? The Navy. Navy. Uh, General Mills, but through the Navy. Through Skinner? Well, he, 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 no, he... Who handed he, you the checks? Skinner. Uh, yes, right. So but he was your manager, your boss. Yes, exactly. Now, mm -hmm. he writes in 1974 about managing another person. Mm -hmm. How was Skinner as a manager back in... What the years we're talking about, 1942, 42, 43? 42, yeah. 42, yeah. uh, 43. Um, I'd say he was a good manager in many ways. Uh, he was often, let's say, resistant to suggestions. He liked to do things his way. And of course, he had a very strong and dominating personality. It was easy for him to get people to do things his way. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and of course, his way was often the right way. But I would say that he didn't reject ideas from the lowly graduate students so much as you tell him an idea and it seemed to spark another idea with him and he'd take off and pretty soon you were doing something that had very little to do with what <laughs> what your original idea was, uh -huh. but it was what, it was his idea modified, and uh, so. But as far as personal relationships, he was very nice to work for. He was good uh, with people. I mean, he did a lot of reinforcing. <laughs> so you have as your co-workers two people, Gutman and Estes, who end up going off in kind of mathematical. I mean, with Gutman scalograms and so on, and Estes math yeah. models. Where did they get loose behaviorism? I mean, they're, they're... I don't really know. I think Bill Estes was influenced a great deal by his wife, Kay. Uh, I'm not sure about Kay. At the time, we felt that she didn't think very much of Skinner. And I may be totally wrong. Mm -hmm. Maybe totally wrong about that. Um, but she was a math, had been, I believe, a math major. She was a very good mathematician. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, when they got away from, uh, you know, out on their own, more or less, that uh, his interests sort of naturally gravitated in that direction. And uh, there were a number of us, uh, a number of students, who began to have some disagreements with Skinner on theoretical points. And I think uh, part of some of that uh, uh, Estes straying from the fold, you might say, mm -hmm. uh, was because he, you know, really disagreed with Skinner on some of these points concerning reinforcement and some of the other, mm -hmm. uh, some of the theoretical points. 
But I do think that he was influenced by Kay, and it yeah. was natural enough. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh. Esty, I mean, Gutman, I'm not sure. I don't know. He, of course, he stayed pretty much an operant be behaviorist for a long time, even his discrimination work in his uh, gradients. He eventually the gravitates to New Zealand or, or Australia? No, not to Scutman. Okay. okay. No, he stayed in North Carolina. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, but he stayed a behaviorist on into North Carolina. Oh, yes, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He was pretty much a, yeah. so far as I recall, a pretty much mm -hmm. orthodox behaviorist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so as a as a manager, did he use operant methods with his staff? I think so. Yes, I rec as I recall, he did. Yes. So uh, you can, do you remember positive reinforcement yes, statements uh, made? Too? Oh yes, yes. Uh huh. And uh, he, w I think he was careful the way he made uh, negative statements uh, in terms of you know criticism and so on. He did do that some. I don't think I ever saw him lose his temper mm -hmm. with one of us. Mm -hmm. You qualified that. Yeah, well, I, okay. I, no, I mean, we, I was the, we were the only group that I know of mm -hmm. where he uh, was in that kind of a position. Mm -hmm. So uh, I know he, I've heard him lose his temper in the abstract, expressing, uh, I, I won't say he lost it in a violent way or anything like that, but you know, very, very strong mm -hmm. statements about other people occasionally, but, uh, but I, I didn't use it with students as far as I knew, or assistants. Now, you and Keller were becoming more and more influenced uh, by the technology of operant possibilities. Yes, right. Uh, yes, uh, I think for some strange reason, I don't really know why, both of us turned out to have a pretty practical uh, orientation toward things. Well, Keller had started out in uh, industrial psychology. He went, was you know, going to personnel and indus industry, took uh, industrial, uh, some industrial engineering courses, and it was, that was his original goal. So he was already, you might say, practically oriented in terms of uh, his mm -hmm. occupational goals. And, uh, and I don't know why I went that direction, just whether I was influenced by um, my husband or by Skinner or both. Uh, Skinner, of course, had a terrific practical bent to him. He stayed in the university and the research settings all of his life, but he certainly urged his students to go out and do things. And I think... Uh, and he'd blocked out all of these tremendous fields to go into. And uh, I think uh, he could not have been disappointed in the way his students took him mm -hmm. at his word and went out and developed these fields. He didn't do it himself. Sometimes he was in on the start with a mm -hmm. student leading the way, guiding them, advising them, and so on. Uh, but he never left his own university research setting mm -hmm. to go into that himself with the p exception of that pigeon project, as far as I know. Mm -hmm. But he started all of these other things, and you know, he, was, he had very strong <coughs> feelings that this material ought to be used. It wasn't mm -hmm. just pure science. Uh, did, uh, did you have any experience during those graduate days of work with humans? I don't believe so. Mm -hmm. I don't believe so. When did your first experience come in terms of the application of behavior analysis to humans? Much later. Uh, we had gone into the animal work. Um, this was the field that we thought we could get into most easily. and It was most attractive. We both liked animals. and um, The beginnings of our work with humans was in the 1960s, early 1960s, um, when we were called on by an Arkansas psychologist, uh, Jerry Bensberg, to go with him down into Louisiana, uh, Alexand near Alexandria, <coughs> Pineville, Louisiana, to help set up a behavior modification training program uh, you might say it was to be a pilot program 
for teaching ward attendants in an institution for the mentally retarded on how to handle and train severely retarded individuals. It was Jerry Bensberg's idea and his project he needed an operant conditioner to do this. And uh, he knew us and uh, from our animal work in Hot Springs. And so he enlisted our aid and uh, Keller and I and Kent Burgess, uh, who was a master's psycholo psychologist with a master's degree from the University of Arkansas, uh, went down there to set up this program. And there were four children, uh, varying degrees of retardation and varying types. They ranged in age from about eight years old to 13. And uh, all of them would be classified as uh, severely retarded, or profound, no, not profoundly retarded, severely retarded. Mm -hmm. uh, trainable, we used to call them in those days, but not, uh, not custodial, but certainly not educable. They, uh, none of them talked very much. A couple of them said a couple of words. Uh, one of them had severe seizure problems and a lot of self-destructive behavior. Uh, another had a lot of destructive behavior directed toward other people and uh, some other problems. And one I recall was just more, didn't have any severe behavioral problems, but was just not able to learn very much. None of them could dress themselves. None of them were toilet trained. None of them could feed themselves. And this was the kind of custodial problem they dealt with with these individuals. Mm -hmm. they, and it was a, being a tremendous drain. The institutions were beginning to fill up then, of course, because there were so many working mothers and people who used to stay at home, retarded individuals, were being put into institutions, and it was again to be a tremendous housekeeping problem for institutions. And the goal here was to train these people in self-care behaviors. That was the principal goal. Mm -hmm. uh, and to furthermore, to train the ward attendants so they could go on teaching these individuals behavior and keep their behavior in place. So we developed this program. We took these four individuals showed the ward attendants how their behavior could be modified and wrote a manual for them on handling. And the behaviors we started with were pretty simple. Coming to the person when they were called by name, most of them, they all recognized their names. Uh, going on walks, a lot of them didn't get outside the institution. Mm -hmm. And one of them was in a straitjacket. He'd been in a straitjacket almost continually for several years, ever since he'd been in the institution because of his self-destruction. And uh, of course, he wasn't going on any walks or doing anything else. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, then we began to teach them uh, dressing themselves, I believe, was the next thing that we tackled, and feeding themselves. Uh, we were there. For two weeks, we left Kent Burgess there to carry on the program, as Keller and I were there for two weeks. And uh, at the end of six weeks, which was the first part of the program, we had succeeded so well that uh, the child in the straitjacket was no longer in a straitjacket. In two weeks, he was getting up and moving on his own. And in six weeks, he was going for walks with people. Sure. It, was, it was fantastic. His parents were simply awestruck and, they, and delighted, of course, yeah. because, you know, any parent hates to see their child in the street check. Mm -hmm. And um, the other child, one of the, the younger one who was destructive toward or the other people, had, uh, we hadn't worked on the destructive behavior particularly. We weren't we quite ready for that uh, at that point, but we had given him enough other things that he could do that he was being reinforced for, that it cut down his destructive behavior mm -hmm. considerably. And he had also started to learn to dress and feed himself. All of them had made some progress on dressing themselves. Then uh, we left the program with the attendants, and they were delighted with it. They uh, went on with it, and uh, it was successful in the sense that these women, uh, and I think there's one man on the uh, an attendant, uh, could carry on the program themselves. And they, by the time we came back on the checkup visit, I don't remember how long that was, six months maybe, uh, they had uh, two of the children, or maybe it was three,
toilet trained, and uh, they were all feeding themselves by that mm. time. It was just, you know, just a really <coughs> remarkable turnaround. And I never did hear what finally happened to the program, but I understand they went on and at least applied it in that ward. Mm -hmm. And in terms of whether it went institution-wide, I don't know. We had some opposition when we went in. The, there was a doctor there who just believed the children needed more attention and more mm -hmm. love. And uh, of course what happened was they got more attention and more love as a result <laughs> of that. They were more lovable. <laughs> uh, and the superintendent was sort of, yeah, we'll see what happens, but I doubt it, you know. That sort of thing. But now going back, uh, let's go back again 20 years, that you, you had been working with Skinner on the war effort. Yes. And uh, you and Keller were very convinced that this was a very effective right. technology. Mm -hmm. When was it that Keller finished his degree? He didn't. Neither one of us did. We never okay. went back to school until much later. What I, well, I did you decide briefly. to stop right then? Because we want to get started on our project. <laughs> <laughs> And tell us about that, you know, okay. going off onto you. Well, we had, uh, we were so convinced in the middle of this project that we knew what we wanted to do was that we had bought a small farm near uh, Minneapolis. It was 20 miles and we commuted to work. During the war that was interesting, but we were classified as war workers, so we got the right kind of sticker for our car. Uh, and. Uh, uh, we, so we got the farm, and even while we were still working on the project, uh, we started to work with some animals of our own. Uh, we got some cats, and that was a mistake. And <laughs> we later mastered that problem, but it was a poor thing to start with. And uh, we got some hamsters and a variety of other small animals that we worked with. And um, then the project got canceled. Uh, Various things were happening at that time, of course. The uh, war was grinding down. Uh, furthermore, they, we didn't know at the time, but the atomic bomb was virtually a certainty at that point. And uh, the need for pinpoint bombing had disappeared. And also, as Skinner explained, when, he, when the admirals looked inside this missile, which was being so beautifully guided by this guidance system, they wanted to see what was doing it. So they opened it up, and here were three pigeons. Uh, let's say there was a credibility gap, considerable proportions. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, uh, the project was canceled, and uh, uh, we went on they, with... They just did not want to believe that these animals could... Exactly. They were afraid to tur turn it over to them. Oh, there was another little detail. They didn't have a really guidable missile at the time. So what with everything, why yeah. it was just... They decided to drop it for the time being. Mm -hmm. They didn't cancel it abruptly. It was contract renewal time, and, yeah. and uh, uh, they didn't go on with it. But uh, anyway, Keller went off to work in some other war efforts. Uh, we had to finance our project somehow. Mm -hmm. So he worked at uh, uh, first at a lumber company in, near our little farm. They were making ammunition cases. And so he uh, worked at that. He was their personnel manager for a while. He'd had this industrial psychology background. And then um, uh, that, I don't remember what happened at that time and why he left that job. But at any rate, he went to, uh, got a job down in, uh, in, in Illinois, in Decatur, Illinois, at the Garfield Division of Udai Hershey, which, of course, became Union Carbide later. And unbeknownst to any of us, uh, he was working on some aspect of the atomic bomb. They were making one part of the filter as a system for getting uranium-235. And of course, nobody knew it. But uh, this job came as a result of another uh, Minnesota PhD, who, uh, Harold Roth, who went down there as um, he went down with Rohr, Hibbler, and Replogel, a consulting firm, and uh, helped them set up their plant. It was a brand new plant they were putting together for just this purpose. And of course, uh, uh, Harold Heine, as we called him, 
uh, when they asked him to recruit personnel, why he went to all of his old Minnesota buddies, and <laughs> Keller became personal personnel manager. And uh, no, no, somebody else went down. Another one, Lloyd Everest, went down as personnel manager, and Keller got the job of security manager. And another one of the um, Minnesota students who wasn't in psychology, he was um, in industrial engineering, went down as their pro production manager. And as I think of all these green kids running that plant, it horrifies me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there were some interesting things um, that happened on that too. But uh, anyway, uh, while that was going on, I was working with these animals back home. And I did go back, I said we both left uh, I did go back and try to do some work on my Ph.D. then. I went, we had both finished all of the work for our Ph.D.s except our dissertations. And so I went back and took some uh, uh, courses toward that. I'd finished all my class work, but I tried to take, you know, just mm -hmm. special courses, readings and things like that to get ready for my Ph.D., but it soon began to be too much uh, mm -hmm. with uh, the, the farm and the animals and everything. And, so I began to take fewer and fewer courses and work more and more with animals. And uh, So we did a lot of our pilot work there, you might say. And as soon as the war was over, why we plunged into it in earnest. And uh, since we knew people at General Mills, we decided you know, this is where we'll try to sell our first project. What can we sell them? And so we had to dream up a project that they could buy. And they were in the farm feed business at the time. So we conceived the idea of some farm animals to advertise, we decided to go into advertising. We toyed around with a lot of other ideas of en mm -hmm. entertainment and so forth. And uh, uh, television wasn't around then, but movies were. And uh, but uh, this advertising looked like the hottest bet to get some sponsorship. And so we sold General Mills on the idea of using a set of our trained animals, and we fixed on chickens as being like pigeons and also domestic adaptable, and they were farm animals. It was a very fortunate choice. We, there are a lot of things we didn't know at the time, and we could have done much worse. Mm -hmm. But uh, they took us at our word, and uh, actually we, from the time Keller left his job to the time we sold the project, we had to have something to show them because they weren't going to buy, just buy this on faith. So we had to develop a set of little acts we could take to the fairs and their dealer stores for events. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it was approximately, approximately eight months, six to eight months it took us to develop these to decide which behaviors we were going to use and get the chickens and train them and build the equipment and so on where we had something we could show them. And uh, we lived on our savings at that time. and It was pretty meager <laughs> for a while. But, uh, then uh, we, f we did sell General Mills on the idea of taking uh, a set of these uh, around to, uh, and a set was six chickens. We had three chickens two trained on one behavior, two on another, and so on, around to their fairs and their uh, uh, dealer open house events, they called them. That was in 19, uh, the summer of 1948. We had, uh, we'd begun this in the summer of 47, and by the time we got on the road with them, it was the summer of 48 in the fairs. And uh, our first, for our first contract, we got uh, $200 a month for a period of four months. We got $800, <laughs> and that's all the money we had. <laughs> uh, and so what you did, is, as you start out in this new world, what you did mm -hmm. is what many people do, you undercharged. Exactly, we certainly did. And, and mm -hmm. just about starved. You know? Yes, what was interesting. <laughs> I made all of my baby's clothes, and <laughs> uh, uh, we, uh, did a lot of <laughs> gardening and canning, and <laughs> so we we survived. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. then how did you how did you leave that farm to to come to Arkansas? Yes. Well, uh, we stayed on that farm for two more years. Uh, the second year, 
uh, 48 after our successful tour of the Midwest fairs uh, and the number of dealer open house events, General Mills were really sold on the idea. And so they gave us an expanded contract and the next year we were still in Minnesota, on the, our little Minnesota farm. And we did uh, uh, f four more sets of chicken acts. And here we took the, uh, uh, developed, uh, expanded the principle we'd started with the others. The part of the deal was that we also guaranteed that we could train their salesmen to handle these so uh, they wouldn't have to hire us to go out on the road with mm -hmm. these animals. And so very early we uh, had trained these people who had never handled a chicken before or knew anything about psychology. Uh, we told, taught them enough of the principles so they could maintain the behavior because these were all tabletop acts. Uh, mm -hmm. It, we started out with a glorified Skinner box. We thought we had to have something to uh, contain the chicken so it wouldn't fly out in the audience and so on. But we didn't realize the tightness of the control we had over those animals at the time. So they, the first ones, they went out with these boxes. So it was, but we had to, it was all hand reinforcement. That, by that I mean we had a mechanical feeder, but we had to teach the salesman when and how to reinforce the behavior mm -hmm. to maintain it and uh, taught them about ratios and extinction and so forth. And, and uh, this was successful with this first, uh, it was just two people we trained to start with to go in this first set. The next year we had to train uh, a group of salesmen for each set of these things. We trained three salesmen for each set. And so we had quite a little people training program going by then <laughs> as well as chickens. And the following year um, we developed a pig act for them. And uh, here we had Priscilla, um, the Laro pig, and she was, uh, Laro was the name of their feed. And uh, she did a little s set of behaviors involving housekeeping and shopping and so on. She pushed a vacuum cleaner around and uh, uh, picked up dirty clothes off the floor and put them in a hamper. And, and she ate her lunch at a table, and she got up at the table and she turned on the radio and then she vacuumed the floor. She pushed this vacuum cleaner around. And then she went shopping for her favorite food. And we, this was a genuine smell discrimination. We were rather, rather proud of this one. Uh, we rapidly found out that pig's vision is not very good. So we gave up on the visual discrimination of these feed bags. Laro had, as their trademark, a great big bullseye, orange and blue bullseye. <laughs> we thought that the pig, now the pig might have been able to get that after a while, but their vision is not good. So uh, we settled on this. We knew that they had good smell, uh, discrimination, good olfaction, uh, because of the fact they were used for digging truffles in France. That was our piece of inf scientific <laughs> information <laughs> about uh, pig's olfaction. And so we actually had three different kinds of feed, and they were taught to discriminate the laro feed just by smell alone. And they could shift the bags around and so forth and pick out the laro feed. So, well, the pigs, uh, we found some very interesting things about pigs along the way here, but um, one of the things it did was that these now were going all over the country, these units. They, we had um, chicken units and pig units in all of their various divisions. They had a north central division, that's where we started in Minnesota. They had a south central division, which included Arkansas, Mississippi, Louisiana, and so on and a southeastern division, so on. And each one of these outfits had a set of these animals. Well, uh, in the course of the um, uh, performances in Arkansas, uh, the, their pig, we only had one pig on a unit because they were so big. And um, she slipped going down a ramp and got a hernia. And so she could not perform. And so we had to rush an emergency pig down to Arkansas. And we had already begun casting around for someplace else to move to because uh, Keller was from Mississippi and he didn't think too much of the Minnesota climate. <laughs> you, know, you know, my God, why does anybody live here who doesn't have to? <laughs> so we had already got the notion, and General Mills had already given their blessing to our notion of our moving somewhere as long as it was fairly centrally located with good transportation so we could ship to all these different divisions. We had, uh, by then, a 10-year exclusive contract with General Mills. So uh, uh, after visiting a number of places where Keller had occasion to go on different reasons, we, for different reasons, 
uh, this trip to Arkansas convinced him that Arkansas was the place to go. Actually, he went to Fayetteville, Springdale area, this area here. Uh, but he, while he was down here, after he delivered the pig, he uh, came down into Hot Springs, and uh, he realized that uh, we needed a place with a central location, and Fayetteville's kind of isolated even from the state at that mm -hmm. time. And so uh, he looked at Hot Springs. We also were looking for some place with a tourist potential because we realized the entertainment possibilities. And so we settled on Hot Springs, and the next year we got a place and moved down. Across that, say, 10-year span, you are really the first people who have ever taken operant conditioning of animals out and said this is economically possible to mm -hmm. make a good living doing this type of thing. I think so, yes. Mm -hmm. I think we're the, in fact, we may have been the first to take operant conditioning out of the laboratory in a purely applied sense. Now, I'm not mm -hmm. sure of that because some of the things that Lindsley and some of the others were doing at that time uh, bordered on being that, certainly, mm -hmm. although m many of them were more in the nature of studies than mm -hmm. you know, actually trying to m meet specific goals. Mm -hmm. uh, but at any rate, we were certainly the first ones with animals. And, uh, for a long time, the only ones. And I know that there are people who are cat lovers who are watching this mm -hmm. who would like to know why you stated that, that was a mistake to choose cats <laughs> at the beginning. Well, a lot of cat lovers know that cats are very individualistic, for one thing. Uh, no one cat is exactly like another cat, domestic cats, among domestic cats. Uh, secondly, what we did not realize at the time was that cats are very tightly stimulus bound, you might say, and they focus with great intensity on the food. They have a high carnivore predator drive, and if there's any food around, we use food reinforcement almost exclusively in our animal work, um, especially back in those days. And uh, if there's any food around, the cat it's very difficult to get the cat's attention off the food and onto what you wanted to do. <laughs> and it, was, it, it took years before we really solved this problem. Now, another they thing were, that you were doing at this time that was really a first uh, that led maybe into your success with the human work later on, <clears throat> you were training salesmen how to maintain the behavior of the chickens. Yes, right. Mm -hmm. so what did you learn about training people to train or maintain the workers <laughs> across these years? Well, uh, goodness, uh, a lot of um, uh, things we were learning then we didn't know we were learning, I guess you might put it that way. Uh, we did learn that one of the most important things uh, is that you have somebody who's going to be following instructions and who's willing to follow instructions. Uh, if they come in with preconceived notions about animal training, now, this was much reinforced later on, but even then we realized that uh, a person with a lot of preconceptions about animals is going to be a difficult subject. Mm -hmm. um, so not we, all salesmen were going to be, it, ended up being used. It, right, not all salesmen were created equal, yes, <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, we were frankly surprised, however, at the speed with which they learned this. Mm -hmm. We could lay it out in very precise ways, and if they followed the instructions, that was the first thing that weeded people out. Mm -hmm. uh, but if they did what we said to do and uh, used our diagrams, we showed them exactly where everything had to be on the stage and, and uh, what to do and what not to do, and uh, they learned it very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. And we were able to actually to teach them in a few sessions to maintain these uh, simple behaviors. Just a few days, really. And uh, they did well. In Arkansas, now, the, you, you continued with the uh, commercial yes. use of mm -hmm. animals. When did some of the extensions to the military and so on begin to take place again? Okay, um, the, um, that <coughs> came later. What happened 
was that as we began expand commercial to expand commercially, we went into a lot of other different types of companies with advertising. Could you mention and some of those? Oh yes. Uh, okay. Uh, there was a fellow from General. Well, as a matter of fact, three people from General Mills, uh, who were high up in their advertising and other divisions, uh, formed a small company, to and we called it Keller Breland Associates, uh, to expand this notion to other fields. And uh, some of the General Mills acts were adapted to advertise other products. And General Mills had no objection to this. I mean, it was three of their own people who were doing it, after all. Mm. Uh, so long as, you know, we put some of the, uh, no other feed company, as I mentioned. That was exclusive. Uh, so we went into the convention field, where these things were used as attention getters at conventions. Um, some of the places that used our things were uh, uh, Steiner Sales, which was towels, uh, Saucony Mobile Oil Company, um, Let's see. Uh, Did you have some work with Macy's? Or yes, Ma Macy's. Uh, that was a, a little bit later, uh, and with uh, in a slightly different application. No, it was May Company. Excuse me, not Macy's. May Company in Los Angeles. Uh, banks, uh, Voigt Rubber Company, uh, sport, sporting goods, and a number of other companies like that used them in their conventions just just to get attention. And then went on to storefront windows, uh, uh, Christmas time and Easter time. Uh, window displays and store displays. And uh, in 1954, uh, we did a commercial for Coast Federal Savings of Los Angeles. We had a store, uh, I mean, a bank display, lobby display. They had a big uh, promotion going on at that time, trying to get uh, school children to open savings accounts. And uh, they had the highest interest rate in Los Angeles. Three percent. Now, does that sound familiar? Oh, 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 wow. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, they had these little s savings banks they were giving away to the children who opened an account. And so they wanted a television commercial. This was 1954, and television was strong on the West Coast by then. And uh, so we trained a rabbit to take silver dollars out of a purse and put them in this little model bank. And they filmed it for their television commercial and had a cute little jingle that wondered, uh, was Pop Goes the Weasel, I believe. And uh, this commercial was so successful, it hit an all-time record high. Record, it made a record for length of the duration of a television commercial on television. And it still holds the record, as far as I know. No other t commercial has lasted that long. They tried to take it off once, and they got so many screams they had to put it back on again. And they did a couple of other commercials with the same, trying to use the same thing, but they weren't as successful as that first one. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, uh, and also at that same time, uh, we were getting so many requests for people to look at our animals as we train them. They wanted to come see how we train the animals. They'd, you know, been around to the fairs and seen them and so on. And it was also getting to be a sort of a uh, talking uh, conversation piece in Hot Springs and people wanted to come see how we did it. And uh, we didn't have any points to show pub the public this. So, uh, and our insurance didn't cover it. And so we decided to open a tourist attraction in Hot Springs, which was, of course, already a tourist attraction. And uh, so we opened the IQ Zoo, and this was in uh, January 1955. Well, uh, that got a lot of attention. Uh, Time magazine ran a story on it, just titled IQ Zoo. And uh, because of the Time magazine story, we got into the dolphin business. And uh, this is what eventually led to a first of our military contracts. But at the time, Marine Studios in Florida was the only place in the world that was exhibiting dolphins. And because of the work of a German uh, sea lion trainer whom they had engaged, they had the only trained dolphins in the world. Actually, they had one trained dolphin that they had on display. Marine Studios uh, at uh, near St. Augustine, Florida, had been designed as an underwater photography place where people could get pictures of fish and as research and so on, but mostly as the studios. But their 
shows had got so popular that they had to keep this up. And people were, thousands of people were coming to see this trained dolphin. Well, the trainer, their sea lion trainer, was a bit of a prima donna, and he got to be too much of a prima donna. And I don't know really whether they fired him or he resigned, but there was, he left. And when he left, they had one trained dolphin and one partly trained dolphin. Now, I need to tell you that he had spent several years training this dolphin. It had taken him several years to get this dolphin to the point where he could show, play in the shows. And this one partly trained dolphin he'd been working on for, with for a year or so. And uh, so in a panic, the curator called us up. He saw the Time Magazine story and called us up and, you know, said, have you ever trained a dolphin? No, what's a dolphin? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but uh, we convinced him that we could train a dolphin. We'd never say, seen one before. And actually, we signed the contract without ever having seen a dolphin that we guaranteed that we could train this other partly trained dolphin, uh, and in six weeks we could have it in the show, and that we could train their trainers how to train dolphins for the future. Uh, so we went, um, what happened? Well, the contract was supposed to start, I believe, in. I don't remember, July or something like that. But uh, along the way, their one trained dolphin died suddenly. Oh my. And so here they were with no show. It was very dramatic. Keller got on a train. They would, they, no, not much air travel out of Arkansas at that time. So uh, he got on the train. He was down there the next morning. And uh, uh, I followed with the children a few weeks later, a few days later, I mean. And uh, sure enough, within six weeks, we had their uh, a partly trained dolphin in the show, and we had two more coming along that had, were doing some of the behaviors, and two of their staff had learned how to handle the behavior, and they were doing a lot of the training themselves by then. So that was a big success, and we were under contract to uh, Marineland. It became Marineland. They changed their name along the way uh, for 10 years, uh, exclusive for the dolphins. Well, this exclusive with dolphins didn't prevent us from helping the United States government with their dolphins. They had started, uh, the Navy had started a dolphin, a marine mammal program, actually, uh, and were looking for people uh, who knew something about dolphins, and they were drawing from all over the world. They, actually, they had a, <laughs> a bunch of engineers running the program and, and very few behavioral people. Uh, <coughs> Well, uh, Bob Bailey uh, had been selected as a biologist who uh, had been in ix and herps, uh, ichthyology and herpetology and so on, you know, background chemistry too, uh, as their training director. And I guess Bob knew about as much about training a dolphin uh, when he went there to avoid Magoo to their program as we did when we started training dolphins. But anyway, he became the training director and we came in as consultants to the Navy. I mean, this was in 1962. Mm. And um, so uh, we were consultants on the Navy Marine Mammal Program for, uh, well, as long as it went on, as long as the research lasted, uh, 64, 65, we continued doing work with them off and on uh, for many, many years after that. Uh, but um, at any rate, um, this was the beginning, aside from the Pigeon Project, this was our mm -hmm. first government contract. And uh, we got, the, of course, the usual clearances for military work and things of that sort. Uh, at that time, they were uh, there were two branches of the Navy involved in it, uh, China Lake, which was the uh, Naval uh, uh, Ordnance Test Center, NOTS, mm -hmm. and uh, then the uh, uh, Naval Missile Center at Point Magoo. They were supposed to be collaborating on this program. Well, actually, there was a lot more competition than there was collaboration <laughs> and more uh, uh, you might say misunderstanding than meeting of the minds mm -hmm. on it, but uh, they were oriented in a couple of different directions. Uh, Bill McLean, the inventor of the Sidewinder missile, you know, he, mm -hmm. he was uh, head of the China Lake unit, and he was the one that really got it started. Uh, but uh, 
out in China Lake, California, that's not much of a lake for dolphins. So, <laughs> so uh, uh, it's where Edwards Air Force Base is, mm -hmm. you probably know. Uh, so he had to uh, use the facilities at Point Magoo, the uh, test uh, the uh, missile center. And uh, so the missile center people were more, much more interested in practical applications. McLean was interested in dolphin communication. He wanted to find mm -hmm. out, can the dolphins tell us anything about what's going on underwater, you know, to be useful and so on. Oh, he was, I think, more interested in much more in an abstract sense than in any future application. But uh, Naval Missile Center people were much more interested in things that eventually came about with uh, dolphins helping divers uh, carry tools and, mm -hmm. and a lot of things like that. And they are the ones who finally carried on the program with a lot of applications uh, deep find where the dolphins dive down to find underwater objects and so on. Well, um, now about in this in those early 60s there, was was Keller having any health problems then? Yes, he was. He started, uh, he had his first heart attack. After he had been down to Florida going to a number of places where we were doing business by then. We'd done the Parrot Jungle Show and the Caribbean Gardens Water Bird Show and a number of other places. And he had made a tour of those Florida places. And on the way back, uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis broke. Mm -hmm. And people all over the country were in pretty much of a, I won't say a panic, but there was a lot of anxiety. And um, uh, Keller came home under that pressure, not knowing you know, whether we were going to get nuked before he got home mm -hmm. and so on. And he had his first heart attack right after that. And uh, he'd had angina for a number of years before that. And um, that cut back a lot on his work. Didn't yes, it did. Yeah, and he uh, uh, from then on he never really was well. Mm -hmm. he, he got back into it from um, time to time, but his heart had been damaged by that. And um, uh, he was not an easy person to medicate or to keep mm -hmm. subdued. He was always somebody was full of ideas and uh, had a lot more uh, steam than his body would keep up with. And and so there's, the, there's still the mi some military work going on. Mm -hmm. There's also the other commercial yes, work. Uh, the IQ uh, Zoo is going on. Uh, yeah. And you're raising a family. Right. And also we got started on a couple of more very... Uh, one of the projects he dreamed up on his way back from Point Magoo uh, was to get dolphins into hot springs, show how you could keep dolphins inland mm -hmm. with artificial salt water. Now that is something that had not been done very much. It's certainly never been done in Arkansas. And it was being done at Brookfield Zoo and at the Philadelphia, at about the same time, mm -hmm. at the Philadelphia uh, Aquarium. I can't recall, the Aquarama, Aqu Aquatarium, I don't, Aquarama, I believe. But at any rate, um, uh, he got the idea of bringing the dolphins in to Arkansas, training two of them for the Navy there, doing a lot of research that they wanted done on various aspects and some research that he dreamed up that they needed to have done, mm -hmm. and also trained two for a possible commercial exhibit in Hot Springs later, because we'd been having considerable success with the IQ Zoo, so he had his eye on you know, another tourist attraction at that time. And uh, so this was a big project. And that was in 63 when we uh, got these dolphins in, I believe, or 60, 62, early 63. And we had them in two tanks, two, dolph two sets of dolphins, four dolphins in all, in two tanks in, a bi in our big building. And uh, Bob was on the crew. He, of course, was working with the Navy at the time. Mm -hmm. Went down to Gulfport, out of marine life at Gulfport and uh, captured the dolphins, and brought them into hot springs, and put them in our tanks. And uh, Bob was there for a considerable period of time doing some of the research with these dolphins. And uh, two of the dolphins, as I say, we designated as Navy dolphins and two for a commercial uh, exhibit. Somewhere in there, he became the first person to do open ocean research with uh, dolphins. Yeah, right. That. Um, that uh, happened with one of the dolphins that we brought from, mm -hmm. that went, went from Hot Springs to, the, to uh, Point Magoo. And uh, uh, 
we call them buzz and buzz buzz because of some of the experiments that Bob was doing with them okay. on uh, discriminations. And buzz was the signal for one of them, and the buzz buzz was the signal for the other. So <laughs> it was buzz buzz who actually became the first dolphin to be released uh -huh. in the open ocean. And Bob, of course, conducted that research out at Point Magoo, uh, the training of this dolphin uh, with now, Keller's assistance. When along through those years were you also beginning to get the idea that maybe you'd want to go back and finish your PhD? Oh, I had had that. I had had this recurrent dream, <laughs> you might say, for some time. In fact, when uh, I tried it when my second child was about 13, 12, 13 months old. And uh, I had tried it off and on in be intermittently. I'd go mm -hmm. take a course here and there. Well, I took her to the graduate school at Minnesota. This was in before we moved to Arkansas. So I, she was about a year old, and I took her in with me to register. And uh, I was going to sign up for some dissertation courses. I thought by then we had enough material I could start to really work on my dissertation. Well, it's a long way from Mound, Minnesota to the university campus. And uh, we were in a hurry when we got there, and I didn't bother to change her diaper, and so we went on into the uh, graduate office there, and I sat her down at a chair with a book to look at or some toy, I don't remember. But anyway, she was sitting there, and in the course, while I was trying to get some help at the counter, she proceeded to her diaper overflowed, let's say, <laughs> all over the graduate school office. <laughs> I decided I'd better quit. I picked up my child and went home. <laughs> that was my last try till I got back into Arkansas here. <laughs> so, but it was rather discouraging. <laughs> so uh, at the time we were in Arkansas doing all these things, I wasn't really seriously working on a degree at that time. But, uh, so <clears throat> all this goes on, and Keller has his heart attack. Yeah, his, uh, he actually it wasn't, uh, he'd had a couple more heart attacks in between there, but mm -hmm. actually uh, when he finally died, it was more or less just his heart gave up. It was mm -hmm. so badly damaged that he couldn't uh, yeah. keep on. And uh, there had been some other things that had happened along the way. Uh, we had purchased, actually purchased the land for the new attraction in there, mm -hmm. a place that became Animal Wonderland. And uh, we tried to, one of, I think the thing that finally did him in, really, if you can say there was any parable, was the New York World's Fair. We did a, um, tried to, well, we did uh, an exhibit for the New York World's Fair in 64. And that was just too much for him, mm -hmm. going back and forth. And, and uh, it was something we shouldn't have tried. But, you know, mm -hmm. as I say, he was a very hard person to slow down. But at any rate, he... Uh, uh, prior to his death, he had uh, asked Bob to come aboard with us to uh, leave the Navy Civil Service Program and mm -hmm. uh, come to work for us. And um, after Keller died, in, it was in June of 65, why Bob decided to make the break out there and come to work for us. So uh, he came to work for us and in, I guess it was the summer of 65 if I recall correctly, mm -hmm. and uh, left during the Watts riots. That was one <laughs> way you can pinpoint it. <laughs> good, time uh, good time to leave the Los Angeles area, yes, indeed. It was, uh, they were firing bullets at him <laughs> from the overpasses, people just randomly shooting. And, uh, so that's when that happened. Okay, then uh, two other, I mean, you continue doing a lot of this work, but two other significant events. One is you come back and get a Ph.D. at the University of Arkansas, mm -hmm. and you got that what year? Well, I, st <laughs> I started in 1967. It wasn't mm -hmm. too long after Bob came aboard. See, when Bob came aboard, I was able to do a lot more things because he took over mm -hmm. a lot of the management of a lot of the programs and, and so on. And by then, we uh, had, had some more government programs, and mm -hmm. we, uh, we badly needed him to uh, handle the research that was involved on those. And... Um, his being able to take these over uh, meant that I could start my Ph.D. work. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't do it right away when Bob started, but uh, it was two years afterwards that uh, I got started on it. And uh, that's when I first enrolled here at Fayetteville. 
and uh, Walt Richards was my first major advisor. I believe that was before you came to Fayetteville, wasn't it? I came in 66. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you were in the department, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. I was, oh, I know wh how this happened. I was working on uh, uh, my topic was going to be in uh, perception, sensation mm -hmm. perception with birds, and he was the sensation perception person, mm -hmm. so he became our mm -hmm. uh, advisor. Uh, now, w you know, one of the articles that you had written uh, along in there was the article that became so famous, it's been reprinted so many times, The Misbehavior of Organisms. Yes. And uh, you're what other misbehavior of organisms <laughs> have you and Bob seen since you know that article came out that well, our uh, operant conditioning doesn't seem to quite have the explanation? Let's see. There were <laughs> a number of them. Uh, as a matter of fact, I, I should read my own article once in a while. I've forgotten which ones I enumerated in there. But uh, um, one of the things uh, had to do with this persistence of cats. Uh, focusing on the source of the food even when they couldn't get it. They delayed their reinforcement by trying to attack the person, I mean, that's importune or attack the person who was hand handling the feed, uh, the food, and uh, uh, this was one of the things that mm -hmm. uh, we observed. Um, behavior in a number of species which was like that of the um, uh, raccoons and pigs, when they have strong behavior associated with a food object, uh, they begin to do other things to it that really delay the actual food getting mm -hmm. to them. And uh, in other ways, um, actually a lethal behavior we found out that dolphins had was that if they become too uh, tightly associated, if uh, a, an object becomes too tightly, <coughs> too tightly associated with food reinforcement, if the object is something they can swallow, they will. And uh, a number of dolphins were lost that way, playing with balls and things like that in the pools, hmm. uh, because they swallowed these things that had led to food. Mm -hmm. Um, there, and that may not have been the only variable, but it seemed to be uh, strongly associated uh, with that type of a situation. Mm -hmm. And um, well, let's see, so what were some of the others? <coughs> have you seen any okay. similarities in your experience with humans, where you s see something that you saw in animals, you looked over there, and it looks like the same type of thing is happening in Operation of humans? Uh, displacement behaviors, as the ethologists call them, mm -hmm. um, they're behaviors that come out during the course of extinction or when an animal is scanning in a situation where nothing has been reinforced. Let's say they've uh, perhaps been conditioned to the feeding device so they know where to go to get the food, but nothing presents itself to them right away. Uh, but the main place you see it is in the extinction, where they will stop and preen themselves, uh, <coughs> or they will suddenly stop and try to chase an imaginary fly or mm -hmm. something of this sort. Mm -hmm. uh, well, humans do the same kinds of things. Yawning is one of them. Mm -hmm. If we get in a situation where we have blocked behavior for some reason, where we can't respond, we are very apt to yawn. Mm -hmm. Dogs do the same sort of thing in the case where uh, they, let's say they've started to attack another dog and uh, they, <coughs> quote, think better of it, unquote, mm -hmm. they may go stop and yawn. Or scratch. Or scratch, yeah. right. And um, You think humans scratch at those times? Too? Well, okay, you take a human who doesn't have the response to solve a problem, well, they do, scratch their head. So do chimpanzees. Yeah, Johnny Carson used to do it sometimes. When some uh -huh, of the yes, yeah. yeah, he's <laughs> yeah. And uh, people, of course, fiddle with their hair when they get mm -hmm. uncertain about what to say and mm -hmm. fiddle with their mustaches if they have one. And, and uh, so, so there's a lot of... If you understand the body language of animals, you can predict... <laughs> what the human's going to under any circumstances. 
And of course, there are a lot of other phenomena that are not exactly related to misbehavior that uh, you can see uh, paralleling in humans, the uh, uh, behaviors that come out in conflict situations, aggression during extinction, uh, and uh, oh, the whole imprinting process, which is certainly not as clear in humans. You can't really call it imprinting in humans the way you can with some animals where you mm -hmm. have to imprint this animal to a human being within a few hours or it's not going to work. But you see it within broader time spans with dogs in the socialization period. Mm -hmm. And certainly, apparently, that seems to be what's going on in the attachment of uh, um, the humans, the human infant to the parents. Now, of Green, course, hmm? What do you consider to be your major contribution uh, to the field? Well, I think our blending the concepts of the ethologists, that's what I've been talking about here, a lot of these mm -hmm. things like imprinting and displacement behaviors and so on. Um, we, early on, uh, in the early 1950s, uh, uh, we began to realize some of these things that were happening. We had just published our first article on the field of applied animal psychology when we began to have all of these problems with uh, these species, uh, s typical behaviors and the uh, instinctive drift and uh, all of the problems that seemed to delay the reinforcement. And um, Bill for Plank, uh, most recently from Tennessee, I don't recall where he was at the time, uh, acquainted us with the writings of the ethologists. Mm -hmm. And uh, he uh, got us into studying Conrad Lorenz and Tinbergen and the others who were producing at that time all of these uh, fascinating articles on the ethological work. And uh, we latched onto this pretty strongly, uh, realizing that when working with a variety of species who we were, we needed these insights and this, these methods of studying animals and getting to know the species typical behaviors of our animals before we started trying to train one. And that was, uh, uh, I think, our emphasizing that in the misbehavior of organisms and emphasizing it in when we trained people mm -hmm. and uh, also when we insisted when, we're really, when we really want to train a trainer to train animals, we see to it that that person has experience with a lot of species. And we tried to encourage that with dolphin trainers, we tried to encourage it with bird trainers, uh, with people trainers, and so on, that they learn other species too. And uh, it was an idea that was hard to sell to a lot of people, especially those who th had fixed notions already about, how, about animals. Mm -hmm. But um, it was a, an invaluable um, type of experience that yeah. we gave our trainers to. Uh, so I think probably our main contribution, aside from that article, uh, but in terms of what we've done, was probably in training people mm -hmm. to train. Do you remember what uh, B.F. Skinner said about you when he, he and I and you were together one time, another record that you set? Oh, yes, <laughs> I, think I, I think I know. Uh, I think I recall uh, he made the remark about uh, you and he uh, had both had the same graduate student. That is, I had I had started as a PhD candidate under Skinner, and I finished up with you as my major advisor. The, was, the was record that, that you said was the, the number of years. Number of years it took me to get my PhD. <laughs> 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 well, let's see, from 1941 to 1978 when I finally got it. <laughs> of course, as I say, I wasn't where you were working on it all that time. You did it in less than 40 years. So it's <laughs> yeah, that's that's pretty good. <laughs> uh, have you, have you well, I, I could answer that, but have you uh, used behavior in methods in any especially unusual ways? You know, with all the animals, you've had so much experience there, but of, of all the different animals, what, what one detail do you especially remember where you were using uh, behavior analysis in an unusual way with them? Or with humans? Unusual.
Uh, I think probably the most unusual work we have done with animals has been in the extension of the of Bob's open ocean release work where we have extended the behavioral control to animals free flying free swimming free walking if you will over long time periods and wide ranges of territory mm -hmm. so far as I know we did some of the first work on this mm -hmm. and some of the most effective work in terms uh, in, in, with a large number of species and I think what it shows is a the power of stimulus control plus a few other things that I'm not quite sure of and I'm not quite sure exactly how this fits it's more an ethological thing I think than something I can readily explain by operant conditioning uh, theory uh, and that is the attachments that animals develop to human beings and it, not all animals will do this and I think it's fascinating over centuries thousands of years that some animals have proved relatively easy to attach to humans mm -hmm. uh, the horse the domestic horse and the elephant are two of the most remarkable examples but you don't have to get those from babies and raise them the way a man has raised his domestic dogs and cats you can take a wild horse out of the wild mm -hmm. and it becomes essentially attached to this person becomes the apparently what's happening here is that the horse the the man becomes the herd leader for that herd of horses and uh, something of the same sort probably with the elephant the elephant is really the most remarkable there's no reason on earth why that animal should do anything a man wants it to you take the man and throw him against the wall and <laughs> step on him or anything like that hmm. and you see the same kind of thing in dolphins in whale killer whales mm -hmm. nobody has been eaten by a killer whale yet and we did an interesting thing or I the think trainer yeah right no or, or people who ride in killer whales as yeah. well they're usually the trainers but there have been a couple of people bitten mm -hmm. who people who didn't follow directions let's say mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, uh, but um, uh, one of the interesting things I think that we did an unusual thing in the wild the killer whale is a natural predator of dolphins well it's this one place um, marine world in uh, Redwood City, California, they had the largest killer whale in captivity. It's still the largest whale in captivity. It's not in Redwood City anymore. It's, they sent it to Japan. But Keanu uh, was, oh, weighed many tons. I don't remember. She was a full-grown killer whale, practically, when we start, first started working with her. And uh, they also had some dolphins in their show there. And uh, part of our job there as consultants was to, well, work with their trainers and polish their training techniques and also develop some new show acts and Bob came up with the notion of having a dolphin work in the arena with a killer whale it would be spectacular because mm -hmm. logically people would be you know it'd be a little excitement and uh, tension here is the killer whale going to eat this dolphin on stage so to speak <laughs> uh, as a matter of fact the management didn't think too much of the idea to start <laughs> with there was ABC Paramount who owned the place at the time and we had to do quite a sales job to them to convince them that this was <laughs> going to work. Uh, but it did. The first time they came out there and performed together, they performed flawlessly. They, we taught them the behavior separately, mm -hmm. and then we released them both at the same time, and the dolphin did his jumps, and the killer whale did her jumps, and uh, everything was peaceful, and was ever since. And there we were banking on stimulus control. The fact that we had those yeah. animals much as much under control. You as did we not did. see any innate fear responses of the dolphin no. when they actually mm -mm. got in there. Mm -hmm. There was that, and we saw no predatory responses of the killer whale. Mm -hmm. Did you then leave them together, or did you separate them? Uh, at the, at the end of they were separated yeah. in their holding tanks, yeah. Yeah. but they performed together yeah. at the, and did other things as mm -hmm. well as mm -hmm. the jumps that we started with. Oh. There's been a lot written in the last few years on ethical considerations with animals. Mm, yes. Uh, <laughs> I could go on for hours about that one, but. Okay. <laughs> uh, 
well, what, what if you had to state, you know, one, one special concern that you would have? Well, uh, in the first place, um, of course, we didn't use any physical punishment of any kind in training our mm -hmm. animals. Uh, so we were on pretty strong ground as far as the humane associations were concerned. Uh, we became ac fairly active in the humane movement, actually. We mm -hmm. thought, you know, we can show people how they can train their animals. This is one of our goals stated in our original prospectus to General Mills, that we could train people <coughs> how to train their animals and handle their animals without the necessity of using whips and, mm -hmm. and punishments of all sorts and uh, forcible restraints and so on. Uh, and indeed, we were able to accomplish that. Uh, but uh, in recent years, there have been a number of people in some fairly strong positions who have gone to extremes, people who think it's inhumane or unethical to keep an animal shut up at all and confined in any fashion, people who have gone out and tried to release the 4-H club's animals onto the busy highway in Miami, for example, because they didn't think the animals should be penned up, and people who believe you should turn all the zoo animals loose. And um, a whole, I would say a whole generation of people who don't appreciate what the exhibition of animals in general has done for the concern, concern for animal life in general. Preservation. Yeah, life. preservation of life. There is, just as there is this generation of people who don't appreciate what has happened, this other generation would never have appreciated animals at all to the degree in which they do mm -hmm. if it hadn't been for places like Marineland and Seaquarium and SeaWorld and, uh, uh, and even the zoos exhibiting animals as they do. Some of them not under very good conditions, although that's getting a lot better. There's some very uh, good zoos now using behavioral principles, incidentally. Mm -hmm. uh, San Diego and Atlanta and a number of others that have good behavioral programs now. But um, if people didn't get to see animals up close, real, mm -hmm. like this, they wouldn't appreciate them. And if they can't see trained animals, they won't appreciate how smart these animals really are, how, how like us they are in many mm -hmm. ways. And uh, uh, okay. So I, I think the, these people are making a bad mistake in not. Uh, okay, other than the people who are against the idea of animals being in zoos or in mm -hmm. enclosures and not being free, have you run into any or much of protest relative to teaching animals unnatural things? Yes. Uh huh. Yes, that it was an early objection, uh, and in fact. Uh, in our IQ Zoo and many of our little glorified Skinner boxes that we've sent around to the fairs, the coin-operated animal acts and all of these things, um, we have tried to make animals, you might say, look like little people. They are playing pianos and doing human-like behaviors. And uh, we wanted very early on to develop exhibits with uh, animals doing naturalistic things. But at the time we got started on that, the zoos were not ready to listen. And we dealt with boards and so on. That were you just take one member of a board to dissenting to throw a project. <laughs> and, uh, but so we didn't have the means to develop our naturalistic acts. But um, people don't seem to realize, and we I've tried to point this out in every talk I give to animal groups now. There is no such thing as an animal doing an unnatural behavior. An animal cannot do an un unnatural behavior. They have to do something that's within their behavioral repertoire. As Skinner says, an operant has to exist at some strength before you can reinforce it. Mm -hmm. And so all of these behaviors that the animals are doing are perfectly natural. And when we get a chance, we try to explain this. This duck is dabbling in, the, in a brook instead of playing a piano. We just make it look as if it's playing a piano. Mm -hmm. And this rabbit is tugging on a root instead of pulling a lever that shoots a basketball. <laughs> and the chicken, of course, is one of the most uh, uh, obvious examples, if people have any knowledge of chickens, and that's the dancing chicken, is scratching. She's doing her barnyard scratch, and that's how she makes her living. These, all these things are things with which animals make their living. 
Is there a publication of yours that you believe that is more significant or influential than the misbehavior of organisms? I don't think so. I think that's the most significant. Our book on animal behavior was well received, mm -hmm. but it didn't make the commotion that misbehavior of organisms mm -hmm. made, and still makes, I would say. Mm -hmm. What would you, how would you advise a student who wants to follow in your footsteps in operant conditioning of animals? Take a strong biological curriculum, certainly get good grounding in operant methods in psychology and with, in some, with emphasis on operant methods and get a lot of experience with animals, with individual species. And where you do that is a little hard to say. There are, there have been a couple of universities that have had programs. There's well, a college in California, Moorpark College, that had a program on exotic uh, animals, uh, handling and training exotic. Let's see, exotic animal training and management, EDEM program <laughs> in Moore Park in California. Um, they have worked with the San Diego Zoo, for example, where they get a lot of experience. Uh, if a young person can get with a university that has a tie-in with a zoo, this is an excellent place to gain experience with lots of animals. Um, <coughs> but uh, Then you're suggesting it might not be in psychology that you would go through, but you would need to to go through a program later on the operant condition. Yes, now I don't think uh, general psychology courses would hurt, especially if they have any thought of going not uh, just into animal psychology, but maybe working with people. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, so, uh, but the, I think uh, the combination of psychology and a strong biology background is, uh, is the key here. Psychology that emphasizes the behavioral uh, end of it. Can you name any people or groups of people who you feel you have influenced particularly? Animal trainers, but a lot of them don't know it. Okay. <laughs> what persons or groups would you like to influence? Educators. And that is a, a tough battle. <laughs> it, there have been some dramatic successes, but I think of all the ones that uh, as a crying need. And I'd like to also influence uh, people in business to use the methods more, mm -hmm. much more than they do now. Uh, that's certainly a very important field. Mm -hmm. But uh, childhood education, I think, is the one where there is the most crying need and where the advances that could be made are not being made. Uh, have you used behavior analysis in your private life? Oh, yes. I have my husband on a reinforcement <laughs> program. <laughs> no, I, we used it in uh, dealing with our children, and we had token economies, star charts, mm. and, and things of that sort, and uh, uh, reinforcement programs for them for various things. And on your own mm. behavior? Uh, yes, I've, uh, yeah, I've tried it. Um, on uh, various things, some of the things I still need. I need to set up a number of programs for myself. <laughs> uh, I'd say I've used it on, uh, let's say, getting my own work done, uh, things that uh, I try to do things first that are, uh, let's say, somewhat unpleasant and I can follow them with a preferred activity and uh, uh, also used it on uh, diet and things of that sort. I, the ones where I could really use some improvement in myself is writing, which I need to get into much more than I do, and uh, exercise. <laughs> uh, can you think of any ways in which behavior analysis could be used today where it is not being used? I don't really think I can. I think I, I can name a number of areas where it certainly could be used, be used a lot more. But I can't say I can think of an area where it hasn't been tried. Sports psychology until a few years ago, but now that the behavior modification people are getting into that too. Now that Skinner is gone, do you see any outstanding individual taking his place as a leader in the field? Any single individual 
I can't honestly say that I see a single individual at this point. Now maybe there won't be. The time of individual influence, I think, may be gone in a lot of fields mm -hmm. because we have become so spread out. There's so many specialties now. There are specialties within behavior modification. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of fine people, uh, fine research people, and fine appliers in many fields. Mm -hmm. But as far as singling one of them out who even has the ambition or the de desire to become uh, Skinner's uh, replacement, I, I, don't, I can't think of anybody. Where do you think the field is going? I, I think, I, I'm optimistic. I think it's, uh, I think that uh, it's being expanded in many areas. And one thing that I have observed recently with some of the experiences we've had talking with people around the country in various areas, not in universities necessarily, uh, particularly I'd say not in universities, but it has gone into the culture. Uh, many people, like the animal trainers I mentioned, don't realize what methods they're using. They're using them mm -hmm. and it's just become part of what they do every day. The same thing is happening in many people who are applying it to uh, the education of uh, uh, problem learning, uh, children who are uh, slow learners and retarded and so on. Mm -hmm. Many, I'd say hundreds of people are probably using the methods that don't realize what they are, what they're called, where they came from. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe it's getting into industry, maybe in the same way, business and industry. Not quite to that extent, but. Most people seem to have, uh, are, are not too sure what science is all about today. What, what statement would you make to a person about who asks you to define what is science? Well, maybe I, ha I have a kind of an unfair advantage here because I define science every other semester for my history and systems class <laughs> uh, as a method of acquiring knowledge that makes use of experimentation or controlled observation or at least objective observation uh, that uh, gathers public knowledge that can be publicly verified and uh, checked objectively and where experience, experiments and observations must be replicated before you can say that you really have a finding. And uh, I think mainly the total objectivity. Of it is what, kind of what has been the impact of science on your own life? Well, again, I have uh, uh, a sort of a disadvantage here, but uh, I would say I live it. <laughs> it's, my, it's my living. <laughs> and uh, and uh, practically everything I have done, you know, except for avocations. How do you think the average man or woman in the, on the street would tend to define science? I think mostly in terms of the things they see on television. Rockets, probably, medical science. Um, and uh, that type of achievement, uh, computers, and uh, the applications of science in uh, manufacturing and big machines and things of this sort. Mm -hmm. How do you think that they mistakenly confuse technology with science? I think they don't realize the difference that you can have a science that goes, you could theoretically, at least, this, uh, fortunately it doesn't happen very often, I think you could theoretically have a science that keeps doing research and observing and research observ observing and so on without ever trying to apply it. And it's always seemed to me that technology is applied science. They take the products of the scientific research and apply them in practical ways. And I think that uh, the man in the street uh, probably doesn't make this separation that much of what the technology he sees he thinks is science. Mm -hmm. Much medicine after all, mm -hmm. it's the result of science, but it's not science when they apply it. Mm -hmm. it there's a lot of art to it and, and it's technology. Marion, what do you believe that our field can do to try and improve upon this misunderstanding of what science and technology? 
I think we ought to use some of our own methods and, and educate people better than what they have been mm -hmm. educated in, uh, in terms of uh, uh, what science is, what science does, and what technology is and does, and where it all came from. Again, that's, it boils down to a question of education, I think, and uh, if we can use some of our own methods to getting these things across, why don't we do that? Now, of all the things that we know that we have made mistakes or should have done differently, what one especially event do you wish that you had done differently in your life? Well, I wish I had known a lot more about animals before we got into the business that we did. I wish I had taken more biology courses. Uh, I particularly wish that I had known about the work the ethologists were doing before we did. Before we, we were, it was only a few years afterwards, after all, that we uh, came upon this through Bill for Planck's advice. And if we had known when we got started mm -hmm. uh, what we know now about it, uh, we would have done things a lot differently. Saved ourselves a lot of time and money. Some of our customers, too. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments that Marion Breland Bailey would like to make about this field and its future? I don't think so. Can you think of any I should make? <laughs> I have a, a question here. What was there about ethology? Let me preface this by saying, I'm always impressed when people have insight. I'm very interested mm -hmm. in the process of insight. What was there about ethology or the work of ethologists that made that little light go on over your head and said, there is the missing piece. This will now allow us to do what we want to do. Uh, I think it was the close observation of individual species of animals, the fact that species are different and that they have species typical behaviors that you need to take into consideration before you ever try to train animal one, really. You need to know that animal. But you had worked with lots of animals and had success with, with some, with most, yes. and lack of success with some others. Right. Why did you, why did this little light come on over your head and say, aha, maybe, just maybe, this is the reason we did not have success with these others? Well, I think uh, the most dramatic example would be the imprinting example. We did not know that crows and ducks we had tried ducks before uh, we knew about the ethologists, and we never got to first base with the ducks. And as I mentioned, Skinner didn't get to first base with the crows. If we had known that, that probably is the single most important thing that we learned. But I think the general idea of knowing thoroughly what the animal is like, how it lives, what its behaviors are, and uh, uh, what its uh, particular behaviors are would probably be what it does and does not new, do in natural life. It's, it's probably the most important thing in general. It's great seeing two pros in action. <laughs> Ryan, one hard one. All right. <laughs> what do you think your being a woman has contributed to your success or made it especially difficult in this field? Well, I have never felt that being a woman was a handicap in this field. Uh, I don't feel that I've ever been discriminated against. Uh, I, so far as I could see, even if I had stayed in academic life, I could have advanced as much as I had wanted to, as much as I was capable of, um, without any problems. It's conceivable I may be wrong about that, but certainly in the work that I've done, I have never felt it was a handicap. Have you, and, have you experienced any advantages to being a woman teaching at college? Uh, I'm not sure you'd say advantages. Uh, I think that a woman is 
let's say some students like a woman teacher better than others, uh, but I don't think there'd be any particular advantage or disadvantage. I, the uh, only, in, in business, uh, the only handicap I might have had, but which turned out not to be a problem, was dealing with some international uh, people. Japan, for example, we, did, we had some contracts in Japan, but Bob did most of the handling of those, and uh, I think they might have been uncomfortable dealing with the female president of a company, for example. Mm -hmm. It's pretty unusual in Japan. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but as, it, it was not a handicap, but it, it could have been. If I hadn't had Bob to, you know, take charge of all of those projects, and the only other thing I can think of is that the skipper had to give me his cabin on the Mary Kay, or he felt he had, and I had a little trouble washing my hair in the skipper's wa wash basin, which is about that big on a boat. <laughs> now, in all the operant condition of animals, have you ever met an animal who tends to discriminate for or against women? <laughs> Yes, as a matter of fact. We've had some macaws who did not like men because apparently they had been raised by women. Uh, possibly our raccoon has some of that prejudice too. She was uh, at the, the last one we had at the IQ Zoo uh, who seemed to be partial to women. She would work better for the women and seemed to be aggressive toward men. So. Uh, I think that some of the other animals don't seem to discriminate that much. Uh, they don't seem to identify individuals. I'm talking about chickens now mm -hmm. and pigeons. But the macaws uh, certainly distinguish individuals. Yeah. Okay, across those 40, 50 years, have you seen any differences between men and women in terms of their ability to train animals? No, I've known very good trainers on both. Uh, uh, both mm -hmm. sexes. I, we have had uh, some uh, preferences in sex of animals, though, that we train. <laughs> uh, in chickens, we use the hens because the roosters are, they have other things on their mind. They're so busy <laughs> tr fighting and trying to court the ladies that they have very little, well, they're, they're unpredictable, let's say. And uh, conversely, with uh, dolphins and cats, well, at least for, uh, now, this would not be universally true for dolphins, but for long-distance, hard work, the male dolphins are preferable. Mm -hmm. And uh, also uh, with cats, uh, because of uh, biological considerations, the male cat, unaltered males, seem to be preferable. The uh, altered ones had very poor motivation. They didn't uh, be too much. Con they weren't too much concerned about food reinforcements. And the females, uh, uh, if they were spayed, altered, uh, they would have that same problem. If they weren't, they'd be going into heat every few days, and you couldn't work with them under mm -hmm. those circumstances. So we have had some sex preferences that way. You've never had the interaction of male animals working better with males or with female trainers or vice versa? I've never noticed that sort of thing. No. Mm -hmm. There may be some subtleties like that.